panelists who have volunteered their time to share with us their first person stories and observations. I'll ask each of them to take two or three minutes now to introduce themselves and why this topic matters to them. Let's begin with Po Tu, who herself has experienced life in a refugee camp in Thailand before arriving in Wisconsin in 2006. Ms. Tu? Hi, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having me uh, today. Um, I'm very excited to speak uh, to everybody and uh, learn about you know, the experience that everybody will share tonight. Uh, my name is Paul, and I am originally from the country called Burma, which is known as Myanmar right now. Uh, is that's the new name? My family, uh, we live there. I I lived there about five years, and then uh, when I and then uh, in 1997, uh, my family and I and the whole village had to escape the Burmese military in the middle of the night. Um, and, uh, you know, um, it was uh, the, the uh, relationship between um, the Korean and the Burmese was long, it was a long history and there was civil war continually going on till this day. So my family went to escape in 1997, 19, uh, 97 and we had to flee from our home and walk our journey through the jungle all the way to Thailand refugee camp Tha uh, Tham He and we uh, we lived there for nine and years in the refugee camp. Uh, life was tough in the camp but it was a safe place for us so we were very thankful to our uh, God and also to the people that who, uh, you know, the, the UN, also the Thai government, uh, the Thai government that who accept us as a refugee there. And then in 2006, the UN came to our refugee camp and gave us the opportunity to decide where we wanna go and to a third world country, which is, you know, because we live in three different countries. So American is the third world country for us. <laughs> so, and uh, we, my dad, you know, my parents decide to uh, move to um, American so that we can have a better life, a better education and a better future for all of uh, the children. Uh, it was tough for my dad in the beginning to decide, you know, move to a new country, not knowing the language and not knowing, you know, what to do and how to, how to get there. But then uh, because of the children, you know, opportunity, they would take that chance, no matter what it is, the situation is. So when we came to the U.S., um, we were fortunately very blessed to have a sponsor who are uh, Emmanuel Luther Church in Lake Geneva, which is a beautiful uh, you know, town. And uh, there we have a wonderful sponsor there who help us transition to a new country and also how, uh, teach us how to be, how to you know, adjust to a new, uh, a new environment and also teach us the English language and also provide us the service that we need, such as school, house uh, and also health, uh, health um, uh, system. So thank it, you. It, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move on now to um, our next guest, Fis Fesahaya Mabratu, who was born and raised in Eritrea and has lived in the USA since 1983. Mr. Mabratu, please. Thank you, Len. Uh, again, my name is Fasahaya Mabratu. I have lived in this country more than I have lived in the, my country of origin, uh, as I always say. Uh, I came as a student, not as a refugee. However, since I was, uh, before I started school, I have experienced displacement. There were uh, wars and battles in our village where we have to be this place is for weeks or uh, sometimes days from our uh, uh, home or villages. Uh, so I am somebody who have experiences, but not a refugee in uh, another country. However, I also lost about three years of my education because of the uh, 
war that was happening. So I'm directly affected. I came here, as I said, as a student, but uh, the majority of my community came as refugees. So since day one, I have been here, I have been influenced and I have been working with refugees, uh, helping them. And uh, the, the funny thing is that one day my cousin and I, we had to split because if one of us sur to survive, or if some one of us is killed, the other one will survive. So we split uh, uh, to part our ways so that uh, each one of us would be able to uh, uh, to a different. And when we came here, we arrived on the same day without knowing. He came as a refugee and I came as a student and we arrived on the same day in this country. Wow, that's quite a story. Thank you. Next, let's turn to Sheila Badwan, born and raised in North Carolina. She leads an interfaith group and a refugee relief group. She also works with refugees and immigrants in the Milwaukee area. Ms. Badwan. Hi, uh, my name is Sheila Badwan. I'm the vice president of um, Hanan Refugees Relief Group. Uh, and I'm also the lead here for the Wisconsin chapter. Um, originally from North Carolina, I actually got into this uh, line of work um, about six years ago um, with the, when the Syrian refugees started coming into uh, the Milwaukee area. And um, I actually speak, um, my family is actually from the Middle East and I do speak Arabic. So I, uh, I'm a humanitarian. So when I started um, working, um, you know, with similar culture and similar background, um, uh, had that language, it really, you saw the need and the people that came over they really needed our help and support. Um, and uh, some of these families we work heavily with on the ground every day. Most currently now we're working with Afghan refugees. Um, we work with many community-based organizations um, alongside um, some of the panelists here like Kai. Um, and uh, I'm happy to be here to answer any questions. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, finally, Kaya Luanda Gardner Mishlov. She is the director of the Jewish Community Relations Council in Milwaukee. Ms. Mishlov. Uh, good evening, everyone. Excuse my voice. I have a little bit of a call today. So um, I am Kai. I am the director of the JCRC in Milwaukee, but I'm also the founder of Tables Across Borders, which is a project where 100% of the proceeds go to refugee chefs. It's an exploration of all of the different refugee cuisines in our local Milwaukee community. Um, and the, the reason why this issue is so important to me, because it's a story of resilience, of survival, of ingenuity, uh, but also of joy, of pain, but also of joy. I see a lot of parallels in the refugee experience with my own experience as a human being. I'm the descendant of folks who were, um, were our survivors of the African slave trade, of genocide done to indigenous people in the US, and of those who were able to escape the Holocaust and pogroms. So this is very important to me. Welcome, the idea of welcome is important. And it's very important that to me that we learn how to welcome people, welcome their resilience, welcome their wisdom, and make sure that we are um, uh, assisting folks in acclimating properly in our country. So thank you very much. I feel like it's a privilege to work with refugee communities because of everything that they give back to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, now we're going to ask uh, a bunch of questions that uh, we put together uh, in advance. And uh, not every panelist is going to necessarily answer every question, but uh, they'll, uh, they'll let me know which ones they want to take a whack at. Uh, now, some of you have made it very clear what, what caused you to leave behind your co home and country. Uh, others, maybe not so much. I just wonder, does anyone want to go into it a little bit further to help us all understand the, the motivation, as, particularly with uh, the refugee uh, issues? Uh, what, what, what causes you to leave? War was one definitely mentioned. Is there anything else well, people want to add to that topic? Uh, 
Uh, if I'm going to speak on general, because I come from a, a, a country of conflict that Eritrea and Ethiopia were uh, engaged in a war uh, for independence for Eritrea and also Ethiopia within itself in a civil war. And it was because of war that people have to be uh, displaced. Uh, the, the refugees that leave the country are the tip of the iceberg. The biggest chunk of the ice is the display, internally displaced people. I lived in Ethiopia for a couple of years and I have served directly for about three months people who were displaced in, uh, internally in the middle of plant, but they were starving by, uh, uh, to death and uh, children would die. So it is always conflict and sometimes the conflicts are not even reasonable. Uh, they are only based on ideology or uh, tyrannical egos that want to control the people. Anything else? People say that water is going to be the next big cause of migration. Another question that we think will help us all understand is uh, to get a better understanding of what the process of leaving home and arriving in the USA was like. Uh, and you might want to focus on various things. What, what about language? How much of a barrier was that? Uh, you might talk about the occupation, uh, occupation and skills you brought here and what barriers, if any, you encountered to using them. Uh, who'd like to start on that topic? And I know that those of you who work extensively with refugees uh, will probably have some amazing uh, stories to tell and to summarize. Um, I can start. Um, you know, it's not an easy process. Um, you know, we had, when we worked uh, with the Syrian refugees, um, you know, they crossed into Jordan in the middle of the night, you know, leaving family members behind. Um, uh, I just wanted to touch back on the, you know, why people leave their home and country. No one wants to leave their, their home and country. You know, they have, uh, uh, we have so many Afghans here that had amazing life in Afghanistan and they didn't want to come, you know, um, but when you like, like uh, the panelists just said, you know, when you have um, uh, war and um, you have to leave, you're faced with that. But the stories I heard um, just with the Syrian refugees um, with a family of 11 kids you know, in the middle of the night running into uh, open fields just to get to the next country, uh, just um, really sad and uh, no one wants to leave their, their, you know, their homes. So I think this is very important to understand that no one wants to leave. Um, they had a good lifestyle. They educated. We had and, um, Anyone else want to jump on that uh, topic? I would also add, you know, imagine having to leave your home with just one bag. You know, what would you collect with an hour to do that? I mean, you know, folks don't realize what refugees have gone through. And then imagine getting here, you're thinking that, that you're coming to a place with streets paved with gold and you get here and you're settled in an area where there are pre-existing disparities. And so now you've been thrown into another situation that was not of your choosing, but you have to figure out how to survive. And that's what a lot of our refugee families go through. Yes, that rings a bell with what we're seeing uh, in Ukraine with people not even not even being able to take a small sack with them on those uh, packed trains that make the New York City subways at rush hour look uh, pleasurable. You know, anyone else want to jump on this one? I just want to add to uh, Kai's uh, point is not only that they have uh, to uh, be able to pack uh, uh, you know back back but sometimes uh, uh, fighting starts when everybody is dispersed in their jobs, in their schools. So people cannot, do not even reunite with their families. You know, they, they go into every direction they are able to escape. That in itself is another tragedy that uh, uh, families reunite many, many years later after uh, uh, they have been, or some of them never hear what happens to their family members because they might, uh, they die. So those are the, 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 the sudden 
uh, incidents of uh, conflicts and war, you don't even have the chance to pack anything. I, yeah, I just- Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I just want to, uh, you know, say that, like Sheila Kai said that, uh, nobody want to leave, and you know, my parents don't want to leave uh, Burma because that's their home. However, it, you either choose to live or to die. So, you know, which way will you choose for your family? So, my, of course, my dad choose to live. So he have to, you know, come to a new country. Anyone want to address that sub part of the question? We talked about uh, when you got here, what barriers you may have encountered to using the skill set or uh, occupational credentials that you had earned uh, elsewhere in, in your home country? Well, that's one thing I'd like to say really quickly that I find that folks come and there's a mismatch that we, we don't always do a good job of matching folks with the skills that they're coming with. So I've seen situations where folks were engineers or were doctors or, you know, so, or some very skilled um, you know, um, career that they had, and they've been matched according to what our labor needs are. Um, so, for example, if there's a factory where you're going to be packaging dog food, that engineer may be doing that until something better comes along. I think that there are barriers to credentialing. It's very expensive to transfer your credentials. A lot of times, one, one refugee told me, USA start, stands for you start over, you start again. <laughs> So I think that we need to do a better job of that. It's very expensive to credential, and it would be great if our agencies were able to match people better. We do have a tendency to think that if you haven't been educated in the U.S. of A, that you can't have anything worth sharing, and that could not be less true, could it? Any other observations on that, please? Uh, I always, I work with the, with the refugees for many years. And I have observed what uh, Kai have observed, uh, of course, from close families. My first roommate in Washington, D.C. was a Polish trained medical doctor from Ethiopia. And uh, uh, he, he, never, uh, he never practices his, uh, uh, his uh, medicine in this country. He, he had to get a uh, job. So my, I, I have come with the brain drain, we all know it, but we do not know about the brain waste that this country misses an opportunity. So that's how I, I call it. And people are resilient. They will do anything to support their family and, the, and themselves, but at the same time, it's not fair to them, it's not fair to, their, to this country because they could contribute a lot better, more. That's a great point. I'm glad to hear you put it that way, the brain waste that that, that we endure at a time when uh, we uh, are talking often uh, every day about the talent shortage in one field or another. Anything else about uh, employment and barriers uh, in that respect? Because I know that that is a, if all, all the folks I've met who have had that status have, uh, almost all of them have, have pointed to that as an issue, that's for sure. Anything else? Now, once you're here, uh, and the question arises in our minds, and I'm, I'm sure that refugees uh, and immigrants talk about it among themselves a lot, is uh, once you have done what you think you must to integrate into the society, into the community where you land, um, what are the feelings? Do you feel like you're really embraced by the community? Do you feel like you're treated equally and, and not as something different as, as, as the other? Uh, do you feel welcomed? Is it very? Uh, I know that every place in every community isn't as welcoming as every other place. That's that's a given. But I wonder if you would just explore that topic with us. It's a sensitive one, but it's one that I think we need to we need to really put on the table, don't we? Um, so for me uh, personally, I do feel welcomed by my sponsor. Uh, they are very, you know, a supportive of the um, with all my um, the education as well as you know, um, my, supporting my family. Uh, another, however, I do you know, feel, it's not that I don't feel equal, but I, just, I feel like I uh, kind of uh, have to 
be on my own when I in I, when I was in high school. You know, <laughs> in high school, you know, everybody already friends since they were elementary. But as you came as a high school as an adult, it's kind of hard to fit with a group of people that who already know each other for a long time. So I was, you know, I kind of felt that like I left over. So it, you know, it felt a little bit, but you know, it's, it's, for me, it's life learning. So I try to, you know, think past the day. Uh, yes. That's a very interesting point. Uh, anyone else want to take, take a shot at that? Uh, for me, uh, as I told you, I came as a student, my expectation was to go back, but it was about my third year that I realized I cannot go back, but also there was an opportunity to serve in the uh, Eritrean and Ethiopian community. My degree is in theology, so I was able to work. However, I started uh, uh, probably the lowest for my, I have an MD and MA and I had to start to work. And I had to support myself with uh, working at 7-Eleven as well. So uh, our skills, when, when you have an accent, uh, sometimes a barrier, your uh, color could be uh, another barrier but also a lack of information is uh, because you do not easily get the information you need uh, to navigate the system. So because of that lack of information becomes another barrier. Uh, of course, for those, since I work with refugees, language is a big bar barrier as well as uh, culture. Uh, you don't know how to uh, uh, behave in a certain way and, uh, and really fit in. Do you fit in? Well, there is a cultural baggage you carry that helps you, insulates you, but at the same time, make it, makes you to stand out. My name uh, in itself, for, for example, uh, recently, about a year ago, somebody forced to pronounce my name. And I said, if mispronouncing my name would kill me, I would have died a long time ago. So <laughs> that's what. <laughs> I do make an interesting point, and uh, you're, you're speaking about the high schools, just uh, made me remember, and uh, I see at our Rotary Youth Exchange meetings at the district conferences that uh, we see a group of people that seem to be very well integrated into their high schools. But I also remember, at least back in the uh, days when we were still fighting dinosaurs in Lake Michigan and I was in high school, that the international students and even at graduate school tended to cluster by themselves. And that's a shame for everyone, I think. And you raised the question, one of you raised the question of accent, and we seem to have a problem of not being able to hear past the accent. And I, and I warrant that that's, that takes some training. I mean, I, until I left my little hometown, little then of Kenosha, and started studying in Chicago and New York, uh, I, I wasn't so great at uh, penetrating accents either. But it's something that is learned and, and we can all learn, I think. And we need to get past that, that cultural uh, primitive uh, resistance to trying to get past an accent, don't we? Uh, are there any other comments on this topic before we move on to another one? I just want to uh, uh, highlight Paul's uh, issue. Uh, working with refugees, they were placed according to their age, not their skill level at high school. So that was, and they were not uh, given a supportive to uh, remedy or to catch up. So a lot of refugee uh, high school students either cannot make it to college or even uh, remain with just a, a paper graduation uh, certificate, but not a lot of skills. So those are something that needs to be, as a policy needs to be addressed. Thank you. Now we've talked some bit about barriers and uh, the like. Um, as, as you look back at your own personal experience or those of you who work extensively, not only with, with others, but also have the benefit of your own personal experiences too. And, and I'm, I'm looking here at Sheila, especially. Uh, what, what could be done differently to help refugees succeed past these barriers? These, these are not insurmountable problems, are they? I, I think not. I think we have uh, in the third decade of the yeah. 21st century, the tools we need to work on them. What, what do you think about that? Sheila, why don't you lead off for us, please? Um, so some of the barriers we see here 
um, is transportation. Um, so Hanan, our group here, uh, majority of our committee is from the Muslim community. We started um, ESL classes for women that stay at home. You know, typically in a lot of countries, the husband goes to work, the woman stays home. Uh, if they don't know the language, it's really hard to navigate uh, and get out into, and that's what we're seeing with a lot of the refugee immigrant communities. So we started um, an ESL class. We actually have a lot of volunteers um, from different uh, groups, churches, synagogues, mosques that, uh, that help us uh, bring these women to uh, class. Uh, transportation is a big one here. Um, is a is a big problem. Uh, not learning, not knowing how to ride the bus. Um, yes, language is a barrier um, for those. I mean, it really depends on their education level. Uh, with the Afghans, we have a lot of them that speak English, that are educated, that are assisting us. They're actually assisting us here in the Milwaukee area. So I think for me um, uh, that, you know, language is definitely a barrier um, for, is another big, big, you know, big problem for us here as well. Thank you for mentioning transportation. The, the uh, Human Development Services folks know, and it's been proven very, very obviously uh, that the uh, one of the biggest barriers to uh, lifting oneself out of poverty is to have a reliable means of transportation to get to get to your job. And there have been some really good demonstration projects for doing that with micro loans for cars uh, that were very successful. It's hard to keep those things running, but uh, I think that they're worth it in the fact that they contribute to the economy. But that's my just two cents. What others think about this topic? What what could we be doing differently to help people succeed? Yeah, another one that I want to support you uh, uh, say is that transportation is a huge issue for what I see in my clinic. Um, one thing that, you know, when they don't have transportation, they miss a lot of the opportunity, like um, getting their proper uh, proper health uh, health, and also get it, um, and also supporting their family with finance. And also um, another one is, uh, um, mental health, you know, uh, especially in other culture, they don't talk, I mean, in my culture, for example, we don't talk about mental health. So I feel like, you know, our uh, health uh, system should talk more about, uh, you know, educate our client who are refugee more about mental health. So I think another one is uh, that. And also, um, I, I, I just want to say that transportation is really needed. Uh, that's the one thing that really, you know, it really push people behind. That's, that's all Thank I you. can say. Thank you. Well, it's, it's critical. And uh, just relying on public trans transit is not the answer. I think we yeah. all know that. That just is not the answer. Any, anyone else want to comment on this I, topic? I was going to say, you know, public, I wanted to add to transportation um, and to other issues the gaps that we're seeing that affect refugee communities, if you look at it this way, the most vulnerable folks in your community, whatever's affecting them, whatever's contributing to their vulnerability, sorry, I can't talk tonight. If you improve on that, you lift up the entire community. So if there's a transportation issue, that means you could, you could improve public transportation of which Milwaukee has a, um, an issue with public transportation that's accessible, meaning that it's open at all hours and it connects folks who live in the city to the suburbs. We don't have that sort of system. If we were to improve that system, it would improve the lives of refugees and others who are you know, challenged by transportation. I think that we need a coordinated system of support uh, between agencies. And I think that also um, we need to work on um, addressing gaps such as the trauma, like Poe was talking about, that refugees are coming with. If we improved our mental health system, that would help. And if we had culturally responsive care for folks. And also, I think that, for example, years ago, Sheila and I put on a, a woman's um, group, support group to address isolation, where we said, let's bring women together from different backgrounds to do Zumba or to dance or to talk. And it really, really did address that social isolation, isolation. And it also helped folks make connections with each other. Thank you. 
That's very, very enlightening and helpful to our understanding, I think. And the, the point is well taken that uh, some of these the mental health services, the availability of mental health services, the availability of transportation are issues that affect everybody and are, and are um, foundational to uh, lifting people out of poverty. And uh, in fact, most of the people who are in poverty here in Kenosha, in Kenosha County are, are white, as a matter of fact. So, uh, and, and we're born and raised here. Are there things that we should be doing better? Now, you've, you've, you've pinned out a couple of really, really important ones. Uh, are there other issues that, uh, there's another influx of refugees coming, I don't know where, well, Ukraine probably, but who knows where the next, uh, next is going to come. And as I referenced at the beginning, waves of refugees and population movements caused by whatever, and we're gonna see more and more with climate. Uh, we need to be prepared and think ahead. So what, what would you say to someone who's really serious a Rotarian, a city planner, a mayor, a legislator. What should we be doing? How should we be thinking ahead, you folks feel? Who'd like to try to start that out, please? Uh, if I may add a little bit would be, for example, all you have, uh, if I have to add to what has been said is, uh, when the Iraqis were coming, a lot of them were educated. We, when refugees come, they come, from rural areas to high level metropolitan, cosmopolitan people who are educated. So we we lump them all together and we do not analyze their skill level and we do not group them. And when the uh, Iraqis, the refugee resettlement agency will complain because they are very difficult to resettle. And one day I was discussing because I was in that resettlement program but I did not have uh, Iraqi experience. And I said, What's happening? We are taking them to ESL classes and say, well, ESL classes at uh, local communities are not going to help them. Take them to MATC or other places where their level of uh, English is more sophisticated. Even if they don't know English, their education level, they should be in a, in a, a university or college environment. That's one thing. The second thing is that Minnesota has done a little bit better than us because they have been training medical professionals, including doctors and nurses to start their, uh, uh, in their profession. And they have succeeded, but Wisconsin lags behind on that. And it would be good also to do the same thing, like uh, bringing together uh, engineers and other uh, professionals together and be able to work together and improve themselves. It makes me think that many professional societies and uh, organizations, guilds, tradesmen's unions can be, and some of them already are, I know, uh, could be doing more and thinking in that way. That's very interesting. Some other comments. Um, I just wanted to add that um, I was actually, uh, I spoke at a networking brunch about uh, three weeks ago at the Milwaukee Muslim Women's Coalition. And there is an organization here in Milwaukee that is helping um, uh, refugee and immigrants with credentialing. Um, it's a nonprofit. I can actually put it in the chat. Um, I just wanted to mention that, but they are helping uh, um, refugees that have um, to help them with credentialing. So I will add that into the chat or I can send it to um, one of the... Is that specifically for the Milwaukee uh, area, it. Sheila? It is, yes, it is. It's in the Milwaukee area. So that's an opportunity for the rest of us. Anything else on that question or we'll move on? Huh? Oh yeah, another thing that I want to uh, add is, uh, I have, you know, I have talked to uh, many clients that I work with. Uh, the concern that they are having is, you know, uh, housing costs. Is it is ridiculous? Get it's too expensive for some of the family that who just recently moved to the U.S. and um, and not only that, you know, um, if I've, I'm my you know dream or wish is that if we have more affordable ap apartments or houses, that would be great for family and also in a safer neighborhood so that parents don't have to worry about their kid playing outside and you know, uh, like get shot, uh, you know? So it's, it's just like safer neighborhood. I mean, we already know that this family came from a country that, um, 
you know, tortured by the government or by, you know, the people there who, uh, you know, want them to, uh, you know, they want to genocide the whole ethnic group. So coming to this country, we, we you know, I hope, uh, I wish that in the future that the government would think about, you know, their safety and, and also more affordable house. I hear you saying that people get re-traumatized almost. Right, uh, re yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, with, uh, as you know, a lot of people of us that live in the refugee camp, we are traumatized by people with higher authority because they're taking advantage of, you know, the people that live in refugee camp. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, hi, this is Frey. Can I say something? Please. Yes, I think one thing that no one has mentioned is uh, when it comes to refugees, especially Africans are looked at a security risk and have gotten a colder reception. And as we have seen recently that with the Ukraine refugees, everybody was willing to help them. So I think one thing we can do differently is to have open heart to help regardless of you know, where they come from or what language they speak. I think that makes a huge difference. Thank you. Let's move on, I think, to another question. Uh, uh, we've named some of them, but are there, are there one or two things that you would say are the greatest roadblocks to achieving uh, the American dream as it's uh, dreamt by refugees? Uh, Maybe that's a meaningless question. I don't know. <laughs> we all talk about the American dream. We're born and raised in this country. Sometimes I wonder if we even know what it is. Um, but what, what, do you, what do you think about that? What, what are, where are the biggest roadblocks? Is, is it just transportation and language uh, and, and housing? Uh, are there other things that we ought to be looking at as well? Uh, this is for Sahai. I have one thing observation for everybody to understand. Number one, refugees are mostly, not always, but a lot of times are considered as freeloaders that they are coming to uh, uh, take away resources rather than contribute. That is far from the truth. They are resilient, they are contributors. If there is anybody who is not cynical about the American dream are refugees. They work hard, they, they are very future uh, forward looking. They invest a lot in their uh, children, regardless how much sa sacrifice they put on themselves. So uh, the American dream is alive in the refugees, but the system has to see them differently. As number one is uh, resettlement is a humanitarian uh, uh, program. So it has to be seen as such, but refugees also contribute to the society and this country is made up of uh, immigrants and, uh, and refugees who wanted safety and better future for, for themselves and for their children. But it was only in 1980 to uh, first point that uh, Africans were allowed to be ref in this country until 1980, no African was accepted as a refugee as a group, uh, maybe individual asylees were accepted. So we still have a long way to go to see Africans as uh, uh, to be considered as humanitarian and need, not a freeloaders or uh, risks. Maybe the African refugees are also and immigrant immigrants are the most educated and highly educated people than any immigrant group as well. That's also missing. Yes, and the refugees and immigrants have created a lot of wealth in this country and invented amazing things and contributed amazing leadership in so many fields, isn't that so? Anyone else wanna go on that? Uh, yeah, I was gonna to add to that. Folks don't realize that the history of refugee resettlement came out of the civil rights movement in, in the US. So that's, if we could learn more about our history and also if we could learn more about how we've accepted certain refugees and not others. When I look at what's happening at the Haitian, in the, for the Haitians who are trying to come across the border, when I look about, when I think about what Frey and Fesahai have spoken about as far as the welcome or lack of welcome of African refugees, I think that we all need to re-examine policies and how, we, how those policies are carried out. 
regarding welcome, regarding refugee resettlement. The Cato Institute, which is a very conservative think tank, released a study back in 2018 and 2019 that proved that refugees bring billions of dollars to the economy through entrepreneurship, through, um, through employment, through consumption. So that's a lot more than that what's taken. So whenever folks are saying things like refugees are taking jobs or taking, you know, taking resources away, that is not founded at all. It's actually been proven uh, incorrect by the Cato Institute. It would be wonderful if we could find a reference and put it in the chat or send it out later with uh, information about the next DEI. Uh, seminar to uh, include that. That's wonderful. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Anything else? I'd like to shift gears a little bit and ask you from your point of view and, and your experiences in working with others, um, what, what should we do as, as individuals and perhaps as Rotarians and small and large groups through club and district and international action. What, what should we do as, a, as neighbors, uh, as uh, service providers in faith-based organizations, as a, as a job interview, if I'm interviewing for jobs? Uh, what, how should we be behaving differently? Uh, and what are we doing that's right? Uh, what different cultural expectations should be we, we aware of as we go about our lives in, in these roles, folks? What, what could you tell us? I think it's the usual suspect starting. <laughs> you know, this is the barrier is, uh, I was looking for a job uh, some years ago and I went to this guy who has this, uh, you know, the connections and showed him my resume, when he looked at my studies, you know, as a black person, you would scare me because this is your uh, studies is a lot to do a lot with the African and African American and other things. So, so we, even our education sometimes becomes a threat instead of an, an enhancement to the community. That is my personal experience. So we should not see uh, at the person of his or of origin or name or own, but uh, what he or she can contribute. So those are something that for me that was, he was advising me as a friend because he will not be hired with this resume. And he told oh. me to change my resume. That in itself for me was a very, very, very damning uh, experience. It's like a slap in the face, isn't it? I'd like each of you to comment on this because it's such a really important topic. And I know you each have something to, to bring to this topic. Who'd like to go next? I'll go next. Um, I think, uh, I think one of the biggest things that really helped, um, that really helped um, so far the Afghans is we have a lot of great volunteers that have been assisting us with making resumes, um, uh, assisting families with um, grocery shopping, um, taking them to doctor appointments, teaching them, um, uh, you know, how to open their mail. Um, these are really important things. Uh, uh, just even time, you know, time management, you know, the American, American lifestyle is definitely different than, you know, many countries. Um, time is a big problem. <laughs> Uh, you know, time management and uh, knowing that, okay, if you have a doctor appointment to be um, on time, but uh, just jumping in uh, as uh, many groups, you know, we work with a lot of churches and synagogues and mosques and many different organizations that really just uh, jumped in. We have retired professors from Marquette that are assisting us with day-to-day -day, um, and just they're learning, you know, they, they come to me and they're just you know, they are learning from the refugees themselves. They feel like they've learned so much um, from their culture. Um, and, you know, there's, there's things that education is important. Um, the culture, sometimes they might have things that might be acceptable in their culture, but here it's not acceptable. So educating them what's right and wrong. 
um, you know, and this is so important. Um, uh, but I think that's the best way, you know, what I've seen is really um, groups that want to help or fight, you know, um, with this, you know, especially like Kai and all the panelists mentioned, you know, um, our group doesn't just help, you know, one set of refugees, we help all refugees. Um, if they're coming from, you know, Republic of Congo or um, from uh, Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan, wherever, you know, or, or Burma, um, getting to know all the different cultures. Cause I can tell you, I learned, um, you know, I'm, you know, I learned a lot from many cultures just working with refugees in the last six years. So I hear you say, jump in. Uh, don't wait for somebody to train you. Jump in, uh, get the best advice you can. Listen, listen, listen. Is that a fair summary? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, um, you know, we we jumped in. I mean, I jumped in just filling in gaps. You know, there was there's a need. There's definitely a need. Um, and uh, Kai will tell you <laughs> there's definitely a need. Um, you know, we. Um, Go ahead. I'm sorry. You were saying something. Oh. Did you have something else? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought I cut you off. Um, but yeah, this is honestly the best way to learn sometimes is just to jump in and work with a family or work, you know, with, um, I, uh, grew up in the South and one of my best friends was from Afghanistan and I didn't know a lot of the stuff that I'm learning every day, you know, I come from that culture, you know, we, a lot of us come from the Muslim culture and I'm still, you know, learning there's different tribes that I don't know about, you know, in Afghanistan. Um, so I think it's the best way for people to learn is to jump in. All right. I'm going to go to the ladies at the bottom of my screen here. <laughs> I was going to uh, say we're do what we're doing well is I think that we're, um, there is so much interest and concern in our Milwaukee community for refugees. I see that. I've seen that, for example, with tables across borders when dinners sell out in 24 hours of me posting the tickets. Wow. People want to help. And 100% of the you know, proceeds go to refugees. So that tells me people want to help. When I see folks helping out Hanan, refugee relief, people really want to help. I think what we could be looking at doing better is empowering refugees so that you know, passing the mic, I don't know if there's a better way to say it. There are so many leaders within refugee communities and we should be the intermediary to help folks get to that next stage and then pass the leadership on for them to run the organizations that are you know, providing refugee resettlement and everything else. That's very, very important. And I also wanna say that um, you know, when, in addressing racism, um, you know, I think it's on all of us. Look around at who's in our social circle. Are we only friends with people who are English speakers? Are we only friends with, with people who look like us? There, there are things that we can all improve in our own circle, in our own workplace, in our own place of worship, and that can be to be more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Poe, <laughs> I've finally gotten around to asking you that same question. What, uh, what are we doing well? What are we, aren't we doing well? What should we, we be doing as neighbors, as faith-based organization leaders and and uh, congregation members and as job interviewers, how should we be behaving better? And if we're doing some things right, you might want to tell us those too. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, um, I will echo uh, Kai's message that we should, you know, encourage uh, our refugee or people there who, you know, are not English speaker to become a leader. I know that Kai's, you know, stream is to have uh, a refugee become a leader. And uh, I know, uh, and also um, in, you know, with the clinic that I'm working, we have seen people volunteer. Uh, it would be great. And also, you know, it would be great to have a provider that who interested in working with the refugee community. Uh, and also, um, what is another thing? And you know, not only 
uh, also, it, you know, educate um, the client about the what. I, I, it's just like um, not only uh, empower the you know people, but it, uh, the refugee also empower pe people. Let them know that you know this refugee can become better than you know who they are. Thank you. I wonder if we could uh, move on to a question that's on the positive side, and that is um, thinking back uh, in your experience as coming to this country, or if that wasn't your experience and uh, your experience in working with others, and maybe some of you could comment it both ways, uh, what's the greatest accommodation uh, or help or uh, reaching out that uh, helped you the most uh, or that your refugee community was helped most by. Any any things you'd like to identify? Um, when I came as a student, I was lucky to connect with uh, people who were in Eritrea as a Peace Corps or other, so that were they were my mentors in this country. That was a great help. However, I also uh, experienced the evolution or the evolving of refugee resettlements. In the 80s, they were just bringing you, and if you are lucky, they will find you an interpreter, but now it's mandatory to find a language interpreter in your own language. That is a, the second one that I have observed that I did myself is the first dinner that when you arrive here, as much as possible, they offer you hot meal from your own culture. That is a, a growth in the process that I see. The third one is I have realized, which is I was part of this where Kai and Po are, have been working is uh, the health system navigation was uh, a big barrier when we came. So we initiated, in fact, my agency was the one who initiated on two things, health managers and health promoters in order to accommodate the new refugees. And now is a mainstay at Aurora and the state. And so I'm very proud of this legacy. So I have seen growth and interest in helping the refugees integrate. That's great. Who else would like to comment on that? That gives us an idea of things we should be doing more of too, you know, and well, transferring that idea in other, other spheres, doesn't it? I think that um, all of us should be aware of our elected officials and where they stand on these issues related to refugees and, um, you know, take every opportunity to contact them when you can to encourage a lifting of the ceiling, which happens every year. The pres there's a presidential determination that determines how many refugees will be let in every year. And that was almost decimated a couple of years ago. And so things are, keep in mind that the infrastructure of refugee resettlement was damaged as a result. So things are now being rebuilt. I encourage everyone, I'm gonna put something in the chat here. If you wanna keep abreast of all of the legislative updates and ways that you can advocate for refugees refugee communities, I would highly encourage you to go to that website, highest.org, and um, you will find out information about just about every refugee community and every everything that's pending as far as legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you spell, I know it's in the chat, but why don't you spell it for us? You're it's right. highest.org. Highest is the oldest refugee resettlement agency in the country. I believe they're about 120 years old. It's H-I-A-S.org. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump on this topic? This has been very interesting to hear. Uh, I'm particularly impressed by the comment that was made, by the way, about empowering. Uh, we, we, we have a tendency to infantilize uh, people when we're trying to help them. Uh, it applies, I see it uh, as a senior citizen. Uh, and uh, that's not a good thing. And I think that that's a really important point. Anyone else want to hop on this? Uh, and Sheila put something in the chat I want to make sure everyone sees. 
home at Linden, the Linden Sculpture Garden has been doing wonderful work year round with refugee communities and also internally displaced communities making those connections. So look at that website, they're going to have a wonderful World Refugee Day, where refugees are leading in that celebration, the organization of it, and refugees lead in the home process too. Good, good, yes, and uh, we sh all should get involved in looking at those things. I'm going to I'm going to poke Sheila and just ask her with her extensive work working with refugees, are there things that uh, uh, you think that have been particularly helpful and, and positive that you want to call, call out and hold up as examples? Um, uh, you know, we, we have the refugees that, um, for example, the Syrians that we brought in, they are still helping us five years later uh, when we need anything. Um, they volunteer their time. Uh, you know, they're giving back. They, we have new Syrian families that come in. They want to be the ones to welcome them and help them. Uh, it, and so it's just wonderful to see that. Um, even with the Afghan population right now, they are helping us, um, uh, you know, all of the families we have met, they want to work um, from day one. You know, it's not just um, people think that refugees um, want to, oh, uh, um, I guess people think that refugees want to, um, you know, milk the system. And that's not true at all. Um, every, every family that, I've worked with personally, and I've worked with hundreds of families. Um, they're hard workers. They bring so much to the country. Um, I just want to give a, uh, you know, we really should educate people and not be afraid of them. Um, one of the Syrian refugee families I brought in five years ago, they originally were supposed to be placed in northern Wisconsin. The town rallied because of the Syrian refugee crisis, they did not want them put in their small town. Um, they ended up moving them into Milwaukee. Um, it was a group of 25 Syrians and it was in the love, most loving family you'll ever meet. But it was just that uh, being afraid and not knowing, you know, learn from, you know, someone that's not the same as you, you know? And I think if, if people just had that in the back of their head is, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of someone, um, you know, uh, they call them terrorists. Uh, so I think it's important that um, uh, people get to know each other um, without judging, you know. Uh, and so that was uh, the reason they were placed, they were going to be placed in that small town is they had a, a relative there. And um, unfortunately, they couldn't live there because of the, the, people that rallied and said, we don't want uh, terrorists here. So I think this is so important. Name calling and stereotyping. Uh, thank you all for your enlightening comments to these questions that the committee prepared in advance. And, and now we're going to take questions from the chat box. Uh, my colleague on the seminar, Natraj Shanker, will uh, take, take the podium now and uh, call out the questions. And uh, you all comment on them. And uh, Brian Monroe, our uh, our chair may also uh, help out while uh, um, Natraj is uh, speaking. Uh, Natraj, take it away. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so there, are, I have a couple of comments that I think might be, or observations that I would like the panel to think about and give some feedback. <clears throat> One is the fact that this uh, session is on immigrants and 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 refugees, uh, but the uh, the person who posted the uh, comment made is that. Apart from Native Americans, everyone else in this country are immigrants and uh, uh, refugees, except for Black Americans. Um, what would you term that? Uh, are they? They're not immigrants. They're not refugees. And so that was a, a observation the person made. So if anyone wants to comment on that, I'll let them. Well, as someone who is. Um, black, uh, you know, descendant of uh, folk. I call myself the, dis the descendant of survivors of the African slave trade. 
that's maybe too much, too many words to describe. But. <laughs> uh, and look, a question is, what are the challenges faced by families, especially uh, refugee families, which have uh, larger families for in terms of housing and accommodation? I can take that one. Um, so one of the first families we had here was, um, you know, a lot of families were placed in, um, you know, the city of Milwaukee. And one of the big families I worked with was actually placed in a condemned home. And the kids got lead poisoning. And if they're not educated, we're actually, Hanan is working with the city of Milwaukee um, to educate a lot of the Afghans about the lead issue in the Milwaukee, you know, the whole state of Wisconsin has an lead issue, but if you're a refugee coming from out of the country, you're not going to know not to drink the water, or you're not going to know the issues that are faced um, with, uh, you know, but we had a lot of kids that had lead poisoning. So um, uh, bigger families, you know, tend to be placed in um, the city of Milwaukee. Uh, and, you know, not the greatest houses, the older houses that have issues. Um, I'm thankful, though, we, we do have housing here in, in Wisconsin. Nationally, there is a housing crisis. So this, you know, but that's some of the things that I've experienced is um, we've had families placed in molded homes uh, because they were cheaper. Um, you know, we've really advocated for the families. Um, you know, uh, so some uh, resettlement agencies have actually, they can reject um, a larger family. Um, some of them will accept it. Um, just really depends on the housing uh, in, the, in that area. Thank you. Anyone else uh, would like to? Uh... Well, as uh, Kai said earlier, to address this issue to legislators, Milwaukee has so many vacant homes would be great opportunity for the city of Milwaukee or the county to rehabilitate these big homes and eventually they would rent them out to refugees, especially big families, because the average housing in Milwaukee is only three bedroom and you cannot find any, I mean, two bedroom, the, but three bedroom is uh, for a family of 10 is not going to be acceptable, but the city would, benefit a lot uh, rehabilitating the, the, the community. I just wanted to add um, another caveat that a lot of economies in these small towns are revitalized by refugees and immigrants. There are towns that were almost boarded up in upper state New York and also in Detroit that have been to totally made a turnaround. And that was because of the entrepreneurial spirit of those families. So even though someone may have a large family, that doesn't matter because they're going to change that landscape. You know, that's so true. Uh, uh... The uh, hometown of my spouse, Lewiston, Maine, downtown, has been revitalized by the refugees that were reviled when they first settled in that area. And I've watched it over the last 25 years, and I can attest that that's so. Uh, I have another observation, uh, uh, which is uh, this gentleman uh, uh, is involved with adult literacy and sympathizes and empathizes with the fact that when refugee families or people from different cultures go to a shopping store and they speak in their own language and people start looking at them as if they dropped out of Mars, uh, sort of, uh, it's kind of a, uh, you know, uh, he empathizes with the fact that it's difficult when people are learning a new language to communicate with each other in English in a public setting. So I don't know if any one of you had had that, uh, 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 experience, but if you have or have not have, have heard of it, please share something. I've seen that happen. I've witnessed folks saying, I don't understand you to someone because they had an accent. And I think part of the problem is in the U.S., there's only one language that we learn in school or that we're encouraged to learn in the primary grades. Um, you know, there are exceptions to that. I think if we were a multilingual country, like a lot of other countries are, that that would make a difference. Oh, do you have any 
experiences oh. that uh, you would like to share on that in terms of language and uh, well, uh, the, accents? The, the, the language is, of course, uh, uh, we are all, we'll die with our accent. That's not going to change anyway. But what we uh, I have experienced is that the children learn English faster than their parents and they became the interpreters for their children. Sometimes they even take them to, uh, uh, in the past, to uh, uh, medical and they, they become the interpreters for their children. Now they have changed the rules, hopefully. But that becomes the reverse role, parents and uh, children, and that becomes also the power uh, uh, of parents is also eroded as a result. So those are the, then the, the kids are also torn between the world of their parents and the new world that they want to fit in. That's also another conflict issue that parents and children run into many times. Anyone else? I, that was all the questions I had uh, on the chat box here, Len. Thank you, Natraj. I remember years ago when I first lived in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, I had a hard time understanding the locals, but I managed. And what amused me the most, though, was when they, uh, when I overheard one of them telling the other, God, that Len speaks with a strange accent, doesn't he? <laughs> no, I want to thank you all. This has been great. And I, it's time to uh, wrap up. Uh, I'm going to ask each panelist to take uh, two minutes to advise us what what do you think we should be taking away from this discussion, please. And I'm going to I'm going to call on you in the in the order in which uh, I introduced you at the beginning of our seminar. Potu, what's the takeaway for me for this session? Do you think? Um, I'm sorry. Can you uh, re re Reword your, no. you know, the question. What, what should we take away from this discussion? Okay, sure. How how should we behave and think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just be, uh, you know, when you uh, when you see uh, a refugee family or want to meet a new a refugee family, just be open mind and also listen to their story, uh, and also you know if they, uh, you know, need help, uh, be there for them. That's uh, you know, uh, a lot of them came to this country with not, not having a family here. So if you can be there for, as a family or a friend, that would, uh, you know, that would be, um, it's, how would I say this? Uh, they would feel comfortable being in, in a new home country. Thank you. Uh, Fisaya Haiwa, what would you say? Oh, thank you. Uh, my two cents as a conclusion would be number one, uh, this is uh, this country, except for the Native American, this is the land of immigrants. And of course, the kidnapped African enslaved Africans uh, who built this country, uh, who are still discriminated, but also the ones who are really fighting for the rights of everybody. And also they are the conscience of this society to do the right thing. And uh, coming to the point of refugees, America says when other communities come, the pie becoming smaller. And my uh, way of approaching this one is that the refugees are like bringing the potluck to share around. So, and uh, take that analogy because in the potluck, you don't only share food, also you share um, recipes. In that recipe, there is a conversation and dialogue. So that has been my mantra for many years, and I'll continue to say that. Thank you. It's wonderful to share our cultures and learn from each other, isn't it? Sheila, I'm going to turn to you now. Uh, same thing, really, just to keep an open mind, learn about different cultures, um, know that you know refugee resettlement it really enriches our economy and it enhances our national security too. So. I think people need to really keep an open mind and just get to know your neighbors. They might be different, but you know, don't be afraid to know your neighbors. So there was a time when we really needed those Arabic speakers, didn't we? Because we hadn't trained any in our own universities, sadly. Uh, finally, Kyle, uh, would you uh, take some time to give us your thoughts yeah. as you as we wind up this discussion, please? 
my thoughts are, you know, we should always extend welcome and friendship to folks who are like us and not like us. Everyone should be treated equally. And I wanna say that, you know, I think we need to evaluate what we mean when we say welcome or land of the free, when we're describing the US. Um, we should hold the US to the ideals of what, what it was founded on and realize that criticism is an opportunity for growth. And what I wanna leave folks with is, um, I learned a great lesson from a refugee family. There was a family of 10 from Eritrea. Remember that, and they had all sorts of challenges, kids who had disabilities, all, you know, single mom, if she was widowed, et cetera, et cetera. Remember all refugees have to buy their tickets to get here. So they're issued loans. So this family had been issued a loan that was about $1,000 per person, a little over 1,000, including for the young children, the toddlers. So they had quite a hefty bill. They paid off that loan in less than 18 months. And I know plenty of people who've had trouble paying off loans by working hard, by saving their money, they were able to do that. And I remember having a discussion with them. They invited me over for tea. They said, we want you to be here because we want you to see us signing our final check for our loan. And it was just a most a wonderful experience. And we had, when we had a discussion about credit, they were getting all of these credit card bill um, invitations. And when I explained to them what credit was, they said, why would we do that? We, we only buy what we need, not what we, and I thought that is a lesson that a lot of Americans could learn from. Thank you so much. That, that really warms my heart and is a wonderful way to conclude. Thank you all very much for being a part of this panel and thank all the participants for participating and sharing in the chat. And now our host and committee chair, Brian Monroe, will tell you about the archiving of this session and receiving more information and perhaps a little bit more about our committee. Brian? Thank you, Len. You did a phenomenal job this evening. And uh, thank you to our panelists. Um, I really appreciate you sharing um, your thoughts from the heart. And um, Len did mention that we have this recorded and it is on the district's YouTube channel. Lisa put the, con the link in our chat box so you can find it there. Otherwise, just go to the district's website click on the little icon that says, that shows the YouTube and you can get there. Um, <clears throat> I had, a, I got choked up a couple times with uh, some of the things that Kai had said and, and Sheila's mentioned. Um, Rotary prom promotes peace through understanding. That's what we're doing here tonight. Um, we should practice curiosity with compassion. It's, we've got our four-way test. We just need to be kind to each other. And as Sheila mentioned fear, love is greater than fear. And there's a lot of love in Rotary. And thank goodness, um, Angie reached out to all of you because three of our panelists are from the Rotary Club Amigos. So with that, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I will uh, <clears throat> let everyone back in to take a peek, but uh, the meeting is officially over. Thank you so much. <laughs>